Hey everyone, welcome back to Steering Apologetics. I'm super pumped to join us today to have Dr. Michael Behe. Um, he's an advocate of intelligent design. Um, he's from Altoona, Pennsylvania. I was just like reading his Wikipedia um, and I'm from State <laughs> College. So I'm like, woo, Central PA, yeah. here we go. Um, and he's also apparently um, pseudoscientific according to Wikipedia as well um, because of this intelligent design stuff. Um, so Mike, thank you, welcome. How are you today? Oh, I'm I'm very good. I just want to mention that you know if you read things on Wikipedia, you know they're true. So just uh, <laughs> write, the, write those down. <laughs> but, yeah, but but they did get it right. I am I was born in Altoona. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, love that. Just forty minutes down the road from um, State College. So, um, Mike, do you want to just start things off? Talk a little bit about like who you are, what you do, and what got you interested in topics like intelligent design. Sure. Uh, my name is Mike Behe. Uh, I was grew up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, not too far from State College either. And uh, I was always interested in how the world worked. So uh, when I went to college, I studied chemistry and then I became interested in how living things worked. And so when I went to graduate school, I uh, I studied biochemistry and uh, which is the chemistry of living systems and i got a phd and long time ago uh, for my thesis on sickle cell hemoglobin which is a fascinating subject i'll tell you about that if you if you want to know but uh, i was just a normal scientist uh, plugging along in my career i did a uh, postdoctoral studies at the national institutes of health near washington dc uh, later on, I got a job at Lehigh University, and uh, I was doing my own stuff. But in the late 1980s, I read a book called Evolution, A Theory and Crisis by a man named Michael Denton, who was a medical doctor and a geneticist. And his book was pretty skeptical of Darwin's theory of evolution. And, <clears throat> and uh, I read it, and I was startled by it because in my studies uh, in college, graduate school, and so on, I never heard anybody question Darwin's theory. And I never had any particular problems with it. It was okay with me. But here this fellow was pointing out problems for the theory that I had never thought of. And uh, so I got a little upset because I thought that I was being led to believe something that, uh, not because of the evidence, but that's just because that's what we were supposed to believe these days. And so from then on, I became very interested in the topic of, of evolution. And uh, I had never really um, uh, thought much about it before, but after that I did. And when you study biochemistry, you study fantastically complex and sophisticated uh, mechanisms that work inside the cell. And I had always just, just assumed that somebody knew, even if I didn't take the time to look things up, that somebody knew how they would have evolved. But after I read Denton's book, I looked in the science library and found that nobody knew how they had evolved. People published papers saying, things like, isn't it swell how this complex system evolved by Darwinian mechanisms? Or, you know, uh, thanks thanks very much, evolution, for giving us this. But no, they're kind of uh, genuflections to the theory of evolution, but nobody critically questions whether uh, um, uh, Darwin's mechanism was, in fact, uh, up to the task of explaining these complex systems. Uh, and so from then on, I became very, very interested and, and an advocate of intelligent design too, which we can talk about. Mm -hmm. Well, that's super cool, Mike. Um, and today, like obviously you've done a lot of work on intelligent design. And today I want to really help focus on like Darwin Devolves. So it's a new book that you put out, well, new-ish in 2019, I believe, um, looking at intelligent design. So do you want to talk a little bit about like the inspiration for the book and like what makes it different? Um, because I think, you know, viewers of this might have like an idea of like what intelligent design is and what it's all about. But like what's fresh in this um, book on ID? Okay, yeah. Now, in the new book, the, what inspired me to write this new book called Darwin Devolves is 
the progress of science. That is the stuff that I wrote about in the new book, we didn't know in the older days, even, even the time when I wrote my first book called Darwin's Black Box. And in Darwin's Black Box, I talked about intelligent design and, and talked about molecular machinery. But uh, one big problem with uh, investigating what Darwin's mechanism can do and what it can't do is that the evolution happens at the molecular level of life. DNA codes for proteins, which are parts of the molecular machinery of life. Both of those are molecules. And so you have to have the tools to be able to see what changes occur in DNA and what changes that occur that causes to occur in the proteins that it codes for. And prior to about the year 2000, that was for all intents and purposes impossible, at least on large scales. But in around the year 2000, the uh, science was developing techniques to sequence DNA easily and rapidly and inexpensively. Um, um, I remember back in the year 2000, former President Bill Clinton and former uh, um, Great British uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair announcing the completion of the Human Genome Project in which the entire nucleotide sequence of the DNA of humans was uh, was published for the first time. And that represented an enormous undertaking, it was expensive and required many, many people and, and lots of machinery. Well, it turns out that those, like the early days of computers, when computers were large and clunky and had vacuum tubes and, and stuff, that quickly gave rise to sleeker machinery and, and less expensive stuff. And so these days, the sequences, the sequences of the genomes of all sorts of organisms are coming out, you know, very rapidly, you know, dogs and polar bears and plants and, and uh, bacteria and, and uh, tons and tons of them. And one thing you can do is say, well, let's follow the DNA sequence of some organism, maybe a bacterium, as it grows in a laboratory uh, for many, many generations, let's just see what changes happen and how it evolves. Because if some of those changes help it grow faster or outcompete other members of its species, then they will be selected by natural selection and that will be Darwinian evolution. So it turns out lots of those sorts of results uh, have been uh, pouring, you know, tr first trickling in, now pouring in uh, over the past 20 years or so. Would you like me to list some results or do you want to, <laughs> should I pause this? How can Frida uh, bring me back to earth? <laughs> I think, yeah, maybe like talk about some of these results. I think that'd be helpful here, Mike. Okay. All right. Well, um, one particular experiment that I feature in the book is, was conducted by a man named Richard Lenski, who's a professor of microbiology at Michigan State University. And in the late 1980s, Lenski decided to conduct a long-term experiment where he would take a, a, a flask with nutrient broth in it, just some, some water with sugar and some other stuff. And he would put in some bacteria called E. coli, it's a common bacterium. And he would let it grow overnight. And that was enough time for the bacteria to grow enough that they <clears throat> pretty much ate all the food in the flask. And they underwent about six or seven generations overnight because they reproduced pretty quickly. And the next morning he would come in and take about uh, one, one one hundredth, one percent of that, and take it out and put it in a fresh flask with fresh nutrient broth. 
and again, let the bacteria grow up for a, another day or another six or seven generations. And the next day he'd do the same thing and transfer another portion and the next day another and another. And it turns out that <laughs> it seems pretty small to begin with, but the bacteria have now uh, gone through over 70,000 generations in Richard Lenski's lab. And <clears throat> as they were growing, he was watching to see if some of them would develop other properties or outcompete bacteria that, uh, that, that were the starting bacteria. And he saw that, yeah, there, there were some that would grow faster and take over the colony, but he couldn't tell what those bacteria were or what the mutation was that allowed them to do that. Simply because back in the late 80s, early 90s, the technology for sequencing the bacteria easily was not available. So it wasn't until the kind of the mid 2000s that he got the ability to look at the DNA and he saw, he was able to track down a mutation that allowed the bacteria to grow 10% faster than other bacteria. That doesn't sound like a whole lot, but it turns out that 10% faster means that in 10 generations, it takes over the flask. And hmm. so it, it survives and it wins the evolutionary race. But when he tracked down the mutation, it turns out that a gene for something... Uh, uh, synthesize, for some, synthesizing something called ribose was, had been destroyed. It had been destroyed by a, a random mutation. The gene was, um, was uh, mutated so that it could no longer produce the protein that would uh, cause ribose to be synthesized. Later, he tracked down other genes and they too are other mutations. And he determined where the mutations were. And it turns out that those two were in uh, genes that had been broken, that had been broken by the mutations. So, uh, and, and I should say in the year 2016, he published a, a big paper uh, in the journal Nature where he listed 37 genes that had been mutated by the, uh, that had been mutated and selected by natural selection um, and helped the bacterium survive and grow faster in the culture. And of those 37, 37 had either broken outright or degraded the genes in which they occurred there were no mutations that were on their way to building new complex systems, such as those that pretty much fill the cell. Now, there's a couple things to say. First off, you know, this shows that evolution happens. It does happen. So score one for Darwin, you know, because this, these changes helped it grow faster. But a second thing to say is this is not the kind of process that could build molecular, complex molecular machinery, such as I've written about in my earlier books, uh, that again, fills the cell. So minus one for Darwin there. And since the, the big question is not, you know, whether or not breaking a gene can help, help you survive in some circumstances, the big question is how did that stuff get there in the first place? It seems that Darwin's mechanism of random changes, random mutations and natural selection uh, cannot uh, explain the, the basis of life. Mm. Yeah, I think this is super helpful um, in trying to like understand like, hey, we, like, we're here in 2020, like you guys are writing this into like 2017, 2018. Um, and especially with like the E. coli and like saying like, hey, we've had all these generations to really see like evolution at work. And what we're left with really is not what, what if you were like a full on Darwinist, it's not really what you're hoping for. Um, is that right? Yeah, that, that's exactly right. Yeah, evolution certainly works, but it works by breaking stuff. And mm -hmm. kind of counterintuitively, that can help, help su survive sometimes. 
I, I use an analogy sometimes when I talk about this. I, uh, I said, I say, suppose you have a nice new car, but then somebody comes up and says, okay, you know, your life depends on your car getting two miles per gallon better fuel efficiency than uh, it otherwise would. You know, if you don't get better gas mileage, you will be executed or, or something. Yeah. What's the fastest way that you can improve that or you can get the car to get better gas mileage? Well, you can take off the doors and you can throw away the hood or the the uh, trunk lid or uh, other excess weight and lighten the car. And that will help you get better gas mileage. Um, it will help you survive, but that does not explain where doors and hoods and, and so on came from in the first place, let alone the whole car. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and again, you know, it, the car doesn't look as nice as it used to, but if your life depends on the car getting better gas mileage, that's the way to go. So, yeah. uh, so surprisingly, yeah, Darwin's mechanism works and it has important, you know, medical and other consequences, but it's not the kind of thing that would build uh, complex systems. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's super helpful. Thanks, Mike. So, like, are there any other problems that you'd like to talk about? And like, why, like why the book's called Darwin Devolves. Um, and like, you kind of have this idea of like evolutionary theory is devolving. Um, as you said, like it's bringing like um, causing more like chaos rather than building something new. Like, are there any other problems you'd like to mention with like the devolution of Darwin's theory? Well, uh, a, a couple things. Uh, one big one is that the more and more that science knows about life, the more and more intricate and sophisticated and clever they find it to be. Uh, and maybe that s some viewers don't know, but back in Darwin's day, the basis of life was pretty much a mystery. Uh, Darwin knew virtually nothing about the cell. Nobody did back then. The cell looked like a little glob of jelly. They called it protoplasm uh, in their rather crude microscopes of the time. And uh, back then, atoms and molecules were unknown. Nobody knew if they were actually real or not. Physicists and chemists kind of debated whether, whether such things really existed. So, um, so Darwin and other folks tried to develop their theory based on utter ignorance of how life worked at the fundamental level of the cell. And, and the story of biology in modern days is the story of more and more and more and more sophistication, the mm -hmm. more and more and more elegance being uh, dis discovered in the cell. I mean, back we can just think back to Watson and Crick and their discovery of the shape of DNA, the double helical shape of DNA, and the discovery that the, that the subunits of DNA, the, the letters, there are four letters, as you may know, that comprise DNA, A, T, G, and C, and that the sequence of letters is actually a code, a code that tells the cell how to build the, uh, the components of molecular machines. There was no, there was no inkling, there was no uh, experience, no, nobody had ever seen a chemical code before. And here it was at the foundation of life. And, and where does one find codes? You only find codes uh, made up by in, intelligent beings, intelligent agents. In the Morse code, Morse was intelligent. <laughs> the, the guy who made up you know, the traffic lights where red means stop and green means go, they did that on purpose. Here we have a much more sophisticated code, uh, and um, that uh, that was utterly unexpected. And and the more that was discovered, the the deeper and deeper the mystery has has gotten. So um, 
that's a big problem for Darwin's theory. Darwin's theory was was first developed back in the day in the in the 1800s when nobody knew any of this stuff, and it's kind of uh, been dragged along by by intellectual inertia simply because nobody's been able to think of any other way to try to explain the uh, the elegance and purposefulness of life without actually talking about purpose and, and about intelligence. And since that has religious implications, uh, people uh, don't want to go there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's helpful, Mike, thinking about like evolution is something of a theory that was developed in the 1880s. Um, and then we have this like idea of like DNA coming about, we're not coming about, but like us coming to understand what DNA is. And when we come to understand DNA, we're like, wow, there's a lot of like layers of complexity here. Um, like a code, like you said. So mm -hmm. that's yeah. obviously like a big question. Um, when we're looking at Darwin's theory, like, is there anything that, um, they were thinking of in the 1880s that can help explain what we're just observing now, something like Darwin was just completely unaware of, like when his theory, um, maybe not a, unaware of, but like didn't know um, when his theory was coming about. So that's super interesting. Mm -hmm. So maybe then, Mike, like obviously um, it's not like evolutionary theory just ended with Darwin. Um, so you talk about like modern synthesis of like evolution. So maybe you can talk a little bit about like what those are and what they're trying to do mm -hmm. um, and then talk about like why you think they're going to fall short and like doing what they need to do. Yeah, sure. Uh, and it's interesting. Yeah. The, you know, we say Darwin's theory kind of a shorthand, but these days people talk about Neo Darwin, Darwinian theory and Neo Darwin and just means new Darwin theory, but Neo Darwinism is itself pretty old at this point, but let's, let's talk about that uh, for a second. Um, in the, around the year 1900, the work of a, uh, of a Hungarian monk by the name of Gregor Mendel was rediscovered. And he turns out had been doing experiments with pea plants and crops in his monastery garden. And he developed the idea that genes were discrete entities and that you could kind of mix and match them when two organisms uh, sexually reproduced. And so this was the beginning of the science of genetics. And again, Darwin knew nothing about genetics. That was, you know, before his or after his time. But it turns out that the folks that neo-Darwinism was started in the 1930s and 40s. And those people didn't know anything about DNA. <laughs> it's really strange, but the modern, even the neo-Darwinian theory came about in complete ignorance of what the genetic material was. And a, a foundational book of of this neo-Darwinian theory uh, was written by a guy named Ronald Fisher in 1930. It's called the, the genetical, uh, genetical Theory of Natural Selection. And he says, well, suppose you have two copies of, two copies of genes, one from mom, one from dad, and this is a, a trait for you know, something, we'll call it A, and this is A prime. Well, now suppose you have a gene for something else. We'll call it B and B prime. Well, now you can have four possible combinations. You can have A, B, A, B prime, A prime, B, and A prime, B prime. Huh, cool. So you could have four. Well, suppose you had three genes. Then you could have combinations of those, and you could have eight combinations of three genes, and you could have 16 combinations of four genes. And it, Essentially, it's two to the power of the number of genes that you have. And he wrote that if you just had 100 copies, or if you just had 100 genes, you'd have trillions and trillions and trillions of possible combinations. So there is no end of possible combinations. So, there's, so it seemed to Ronald Fisher that this allowed evolution to do whatever you know, was, it was called on to do. But Ronald Fisher didn't know what a gene was. 
he was thinking that it must be this, you know, kind of nondescript theoretical particle. Uh, but, but now we do know what genes are uh, with the help of Watson and Crick's work and uh, the genetic code and many other things. And we see that they, a gene is itself a big and complex entity. And one thing that Fisher didn't know is that you can have two different versions of a gene, A and A prime, and A might be the, uh, the working copy of the gene, and A prime might be a broken copy of the gene. Just like in, in Richard Lenski's experiment, if you substitute a broken copy of that ribose gene, it makes the bacteria grow faster in his laboratory. And if you have a second gene, and maybe the, maybe the other copy of that is a broken copy of gene number, gene B, and maybe all of the variants <laughs> uh, are broken copies. So you can see from that is that, one thing you can see from it is that uh, this might give you variation, just like it could give it in Richard Lenski's lab. And that might explain something growing faster or slower in some circumstance. But it says absolutely nothing about where those genes came from in the first place. It doesn't say where A and B and C and D came from. It simply says that they were there and maybe there's two copies of them. Well, okay, but that's, and again, that doesn't explain uh, where the foundation of life comes from. And another uh, book in neo-Darwinian theory, the neo-Darwinian synthesis was on the fossil record. It was uh, written by a guy named G. Gaylord Simpson. And he said, well, if you look at the fossils that we find in the fossil record, such as the horse, the horse series, what are called the horse series of fossils, where they have organisms that have some features of horses, and then they develop, uh, and we end up with a modern, uh, a modern horse. He said, if you look at how fast they come along and then you look at experiments we do in the lab, why experiments we do in the lab can cause evolution to occur much faster than even the horse series, which is, was one of the fastest ones known at that time. But again, the problem was that he didn't know what was causing what mutations were. He didn't know what was causing any of these changes he was just looking at, at the exterior of the organisms. And the evolution that was being observed in laboratories was in fact devolution. We now know that, uh, that genes were breaking. They were not being, uh, being constructed. Same thing was maybe happening within the fossil record for the horse. It might be that you are devolving, that is, you are getting rid of genetic material, and that is causing uh, changes in these organisms too. So uh, the point is that even with neo-Darwinism, even including stuff that Darwin didn't know about, it was all developed before modern biology really got underway from the 50s and 60s and, and forward. And um, so, uh, 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 so all the difficulties that I pointed out hold if you're talking about the latest updates of, of evolutionary theory and as well as with Darwin's basic ideas back in the 1800s. Mm. So you, what you're saying then is like these modern synthesis um, and like even what they're adding, they're still going to face like kind of like the same problems as Darwin's theory? Uh, well, yes, that's correct. Um, and, and one thing to say is that the modern synthesis pretty much is Darwin's theory, mm -hmm. but it just takes into account more and more of what we have learned. Mm -hmm. The second point is that the modern synthesis does not even try 
to explain how random changes and natural selection could build complex systems. That doesn't cross anybody's radar screen. What they do is say things like, oh, hey, you know, how, uh, you know, how if, uh, if in theory, we had an improvement in some gene, how fast would it take to spread throughout a population? Well, that's okay. Uh, that's an interesting thing to do, but they're not talking about how a gene gets built. They're just talking about how a, a change might uh, spread through a population. Or they might say that, that suppose that uh, a mutation is neutral. That is, it doesn't help the organism survive, but it doesn't hurt it either. Does that have a chance of spreading in a population of creatures by chance? And you can do some math and you can write down figures and say, well, yeah, there's these odds say, that this might go through by chance. But nobody's trying to explain how functional complex machinery and systems such as in the cell, how, how the genetic code arises, how transcription arises and translation, how the bacterial flagellum uh, came about, uh, how lots and, you know, many, many uh, uh, complex systems came about. It, they just uh, assume that, it, that this explains it. And uh, nobody, um, nobody actually tries to show it. But when you look at experiments that are done and, and you happen to have a skeptical eye, which very, too few people do, you can see all of these problems that, that I've pointed out in, in my books. Mm. So what you're trying to say then is we're looking at this idea that um, in Darwin's theory, like the, that, that there are these random changes and they're going to lead to like building systems. Um, and what you want to say, Mike, is that like, even like the modern synthesis, like this hasn't really given like a mechanistic explanation of like um, how this is actually going to work in light of like that our understanding of how like the structure of modern biology works. That's correct. Yeah, they they do not say they do not um, they do not talk in in detail about such things. There's a you may have heard there's a there was a number of books written in the around the year 1900 by Rudyard Kipling called Just So Stories. One mm -hmm. is, is a children's story. It's one book is called How the Elephant Got Its Trunk. And it's a funny little story about how elephants got their trunks. And another one about how the tiger got its stripes, another children's story. It turns out that you can make up stories. Well, how did, you know, how did the genetic code arise? Well, maybe it did this, or maybe it did that. And you can do that for anything. Hey, make up a story. But nobody tests these things rigorously very few people even look at them skeptically because everybody knows or everybody says they know that this must have happened because what else could have happened? Um, so um, yeah, it, it turns out that much, 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 much more is claimed for Darwin's theory than has ever been demonstrated uh, for it to be able to do. And just now in the past 20 years, as, as I describe in Darwin Evolves, we've gotten to be able to see what it does do when we look. And now we see that in fact, it generally degrades genes. And the reason is, is easy to understand. It's because breaking something is a lot faster than trying to build something, some new complex system. If you have your computer, you know, and if you hit it with a hammer, there's not many places you can hit your computer with a hammer that will improve its functioning. <clears throat> but there's lots of places you can hit it <clears throat> and break it or seriously damage it. Same thing with genes. You can rapidly break a gene, but it's extremely difficult and much slower to have a mutation that will improve a gene. 
And if the mutation that breaks a gene, but helps a little bit, if that comes along, then automatically natural selection will select it. Because as we're always told, natural selection is blind. It'll just take whatever helps and increase it in the population. And when that happens, it increases in the population so that everybody, all the organisms in the population have this broken gene. Now that gene is gone forever. It's out of there. It's no longer available to help when some other situation comes along. Perhaps I should mention here, because I, I, I haven't done it so far, that I give, a, of course, a number of examples of more familiar creatures in Darwin devolves than just the bacteria E. coli. And the one I start off with in the beginning of the book is a polar bear. And uh, it, polar bears are thought to be descended from brown bears, grizz, grizzly bear type creatures, maybe a couple hundred thousand years ago that two lines diverged and one was became grizzly bears and one polar bears. And it turns out that scientists 10, 10 or so years ago sequenced the entire genome of grizzly bears, just like they did for the human genome. But uh, by the year 2010, it was faster and cheaper and they could just, they could just pump it out like, like nothing. And they also sequenced the polar bear genome. And they did it specifically because they wanted to compare the two to see what did it take to change a grizzly bear into a polar bear. And in the first paper published on it, they listed in a table 17 different genes that had changed from the brown bear to the polar bear. And of those... I think something like 75% of them were degradative mutations, which either broke a pre-existing gene or degraded it, the pre-existing gene by causing it to work less well. So it seems that the polar bear, magnificent as it seems, cool as it is, evolved mostly by devolution, not evolution. Uh, but by breaking things that were already there. Uh, same thing for many other uh, creatures that you're familiar with. Um, one example that evolutionists often point to when they talk about the power of selection and abilities to shape animals is uh, dogs. You know, there's so many different dog breeds, you know, Great Danes and Chihuahuas and boxers and French poodles and stuff. They say, hey, look at all this variation. You know, this is a snap. We, you know, humans have bred dogs for just a few hundred years and we've gotten all this variety. You know, if we can do it, say, hey, nature could do even better. Well, it's, again, it's only been 10, 10, 15 years and the genomes of all those breeds have been sequenced themselves because people are interested in seeing what genes had to change to give those breeds. And overwhelmingly, the mutations that define breeds are ones that break genes or break control regions for genes. Nothing is being built there. It, if you want a dachshund, if you want a dog with short legs, what you do is break a gene that helps build long legs or helps build normal sized legs. If you want a dog that's heavily muscled, what you can do is break a protein that's involved in stopping or halting the synthesis of muscle at its proper point. If you want a dog like a bulldog that has a short muzzle, you can break a gene that's involved in facial development. So you can get lots of changes and you can select them too, but all of it is being done by breaking pre-existing material, not by building new stuff. So again, you know, this is not the kind of process that explains where, where life came from in the first place. 
Mm. Okay, yeah, that's super helpful, Mike. So is there any other like data that you'd love to talk about with like um Darwin's theory like devolving? Um we talked about a lot of different things here. Um and with anything else? Well, um one thing to notice uh is a uh, Darwin's theory devolving is that I'm a proponent of intelligent design. That is, I think that a good explanation for living things and what we see at the cellular and molecular level is that it was purposely made by an intelligent being, planned. It's the product of thinking, of a mind. And I explain my reasons in my books. Uh, but um, so I, I disagree with Darwin's theory, but uh, folks should know that a lot of biologists disagree with Darwin's theory. Many biologists think that it does not work or it does, cannot explain what has been discovered in biology. I would guess that, you know, one third to one half of biologists question Darwin's theory. One half, you uh, said? Huh? You said I'm one sorry? half? One third to one half, something like hmm. that. So a large fraction. What they don't do, though, is agree with intelligent design. Uh, another thing they don't do, though, <laughs> is propose an explanation that will work to explain the sorts of systems that I've written about in my books, such as the bacterial flagellum or blood clotting cascade. So the point is that Darwin's theory is degrading in the sense that more and more biologists think that it doesn't work. But again, they're stuck in a rut because in my view, they have ruled out the obvious answer. And that is it needs a, a mind. You have, to, you have to have real purpose, a, a real... Uh, real direction to build complex systems. Complex systems don't just accumulate over time and, and uh, uh, by, without the involvement of a mind. But Darwin's theory is uh, devolving in the sense that it's become less and less convincing even to more and more uh, professional biologists. Hmm. Well, Mike, this has been super helpful, and I find it really interesting how you talked about all the different people that doubt Darwin's theory. Um, that's a lot of biologists. That's a lot of people out there um, that know what they're talking about in this field. So let's just do this for a little bit. Um, you talked about, like, you're an advocate of intelligent design. Um, just briefly, like, sketch that out for people. What does that mean if you're an advocate of intelligent design? How is this, like, a viable alternative? Okay. Well, um <clears throat> Uh, intelligent design just means that uh, that intelligence was required to explain some system or some something that you have come across. It's uh, so suppose in my in my um, first book, Dar and Black Box, I, I used an example of a mouse trap as a system that is what I called irreducibly complex because you can't build it gradually in Darwin's, in a Darwinian fashion by having something that works and then gradually improving it in tiny steps until you get a mousetrap because it has a number of different parts, the platform and the spring and the, the metal hammer, which hits the mouse and so on. So that was a big problem for Darwin's theory. But anybody who looks at a mousetrap will also quickly realized that that was designed. I mean, that's the product of an intelligence. Somebody put that together. It didn't just happen on its own. How do you know that? How do you, how do you know something like a mousetrap is intelligently designed? You know, suppose you came across it, you know, in some unusual place and uh, you'd still know that it was designed because you see how the parts are put together. And you have what is called a purposeful arrangement of parts, quote unquote. If you look in the dictionary, under the word design, you'll see a number of definitions, but the pertinent one is design is a purposeful arrangement of parts. 
So whenever we see this part put here and this part put there and this one, and when we have them all together, why, when you touch it, it springs up and a, a clown comes out of the jack in the box. Uh, whenever we see parts put together for a purpose, we always realize that it was the work of a mind. Some intelligence put it together. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> that is the way it's the only way that we can recognize that other minds have been at work. Uh, some people object, well, you know, maybe, you know, maybe, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, um, you, you know, it's a, uh, uh, you know, humans are intelligent, uh, but, uh, so how do we, humans are intelligent. So if somebody does something and they look like, a, if somebody looks like a human, you'll think that they're intelligent. But, you know, a lot of humans, you know, you can, maybe somebody on the street is, you know, sitting somewhere and you go over and poke him and he doesn't, he doesn't react. You know, you might wonder if he's had a stroke or something. You only recognize that somebody's intelligent when they do something intelligent. You recognize how intelligent they are when you see what they can do. That's because we can't read minds. We only judge things by seeing what has been done. Well, now it turns out that in the cell, what Darwin thought was a little piece of jelly, we found the most incredible, purposeful arrangement of parts that we've ever discovered. Like I say, the genetic code, the machinery of the cell that makes other machinery to do all sorts of stuff. That is the hallmark of intelligent design. It's not a religious doctrine. You know, if you think a mousetrap is designed, yeah, that's not a religious conclusion. If you see a bacterial flagellum, you say, well, that's, that looks designed too. That's designed. There's a purposeful arrangement of parts. That's how we conclude something was designed by observing a purposeful arrangement of parts. Um, and so I, it's, it's, you've got to realize two things. First of all, uh, we humans, we are intelligent, we have minds, and we are able to recognize other minds. If we weren't able to recognize other minds, we would think we were the only intelligent things in existence. And there are some people who think that, uh, but they're generally not, not very popular. Uh, so we, we can recognize intelligent activity. That's one of the basic uh, abilities of our, of our minds, of our intelligence, to recognize other intelligences. So when we see it in a mousetrap, when we see it in a computer, ah, there it is. When you see it in a genetic code, when you see it in molecular machinery, when you see it in a flagellum, ah, that's yeah, that's intelligent intelligence too. Mm. So it's it's pretty straightforward, but of course it has religious implications because people see where this can lead is leading. But I argue in my books that, hey, if you're going to investigate the origins of life, the origins of different creatures, the origins of the universe and so on, you're going to bump up into questions that you know, will have religious implications. And you can't rule out theories for having such implications if you want to get to the truth. And an example I always point to is the Big Bang Theory. Uh, um, scientists before the 1930s generally thought that the universe was eternal and unchanging. But then the motions of galaxies away from each other was observed. And this kind of led to the ba Big Bang Theory that the universe began at a definite point uh, in a big something like an explosion. And uh, so, therefore, it began at some point in time, and the uh, kind of uh, religious implications of this seemed pretty obvious, too, that maybe this was the creation 
of the universe. Maybe, maybe it, it, you know, required something outside of the universe to explain it. And a lot of scientists hated the idea of the Big Bang simply because of that uh, religious overtones, but that's what the evidence uh, pointed to. And so uh, eventually uh, physics accepted it and, and went to work on it. I say it's the same thing for intelligent design and biology. You know, the implications might point to, you know, it might, there might be religious or philosophical implications, uh, but the evidence right in front of our eyes strongly indicates design and it would be, uh, it would be a failure of nerve uh, on the part of scientists to uh, rule out that implication simply because they don't like uh, where they think it's pointed. Mm. Well, Mike, this has been huge. Thank you so much for this. Um, and I love your work and your expertise. Um, this has been super helpful for me as I try to continue to think through these things because science is not my field of expertise by any means. Um, but you, you communicate things very clearly. So that's great. Um, any last thoughts, Mike, to say before we wrap up here today? Uh, let's see. Only that the more and more science learns, the more and more obvious the design becomes that uh, with the progress of science, things are not becoming less, uh, less complex in, in living systems. They're becoming more complex, more elegant, more sophisticated, more, more information uh, uh, discovered in the cell so that uh, if you want to get ahead of the curve, you can start reading some intelligent design books right now and, and be able to uh, tell your friends, I told you so, when, when uh, everybody else uh, begins to agree. <laughs> well mike thank you so much for coming on today um i'll put a link down below where people can follow you and connect with you and things like that um and yeah this has been great i've really enjoyed this um episode it's been very thought-provoking and yeah thank you this is here in apologetics everyone if you're new i encourage you to subscribe leave a like all that fun stuff and if you value what we do uh consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash here in apologetics uh, you can do that for as little as a dollar a month and your support would be super huge. And I'd really appreciate that. Um, but yeah, that's that. Mike, thank you one last time for coming on. It's been great. Okay. Thanks, Zach. Mm -hmm. And thank you, everyone. Have a God bless. God bless and we'll 